My name is Jackie Winu. I'm originally from Kenya. I'm a postgraduate student studying safety, health and environment management at the University of Salford. Ah. Yeah. And what's brought you to this event today? Okay, I am, weirdly, I'm an engineer by background, but when I started getting passionate about safe working environments, I decided to pursue a career in health and safety and environment management. And during, the, during my course, when I was doing it in the University of Salford, I just started falling in love with environmental sustainability. So it is something I'm looking to focus at dissertation level uh, towards my PhD and even towards my career prospects. So specifically because of issues t around environmental sustainability, issues around the UN sustainable goals, focusing towards how do we, sus how do we use our environment more sustainably, how do we have diversity and inclusivity in all of these actions that we're trying to do is part of the reason why I came, just to see women who have been working in these careers for years and have seen changes in the business, they've seen changes in the structures and in the policies. What do they have to advise us who are sort of a generation change or coming into a generation where probably a base has already been set, but how do we progress women in sciences to move towards UN sustainable goals and towards environmental sustainability as well. Another thing for me is I do intend to have a rural outreach program when I do go back to Kenya and the rural outreach program is very much focused on achieving the UN goals through environmental sustainability, impacting behavioural change, especially for very young, from very young children, very young women, understanding how can they be brought on board, how can they, in their small, very different ways, impact towards a global driven movement. So for me, this seminar specifically is helpful, much as it also projects career choices, it also says, these are the kind of things that you can do to achieve things at different levels. So that's also another reason why I came. So for me, the, so far the two big things I have taken is one, really about choices, about identifying what impact do you want to bring and having enthusiasm for it and how to manage yourself also as a woman in the workplace. And also the understanding that we are the ones who need to bring the affirmative action for change, for positive discrimination for hopefully bringing down the gender pay gap and just as well also seeing trends of where they see the future in the industry go that's also very informative because it helps me also make career choices so it's great to meet you in person if you're coming here for the first time and to see you again if you had been here last year so amongst those are people from diverse backgrounds we have people from academics Emeritus, academics, non-academics, professionals from different organizations, including NHS, we have students, we have people from corporate organizations and private organizations. We have um, also consultants from Acadis, the environmental consulting firm. We have um, someone from Suez Recycling and Recovering in Lancashire. We have um, someone, a representative from ACOM, the engineering company. We have somebody from, uh, we have a few people from Science Hunters, Friends of the Earth. And then we have on the research institutes, we have from Earthwatch in Oxford, you know, she is there. And then we have um, from the Manchester Environmental Research Institute, we have from Open University at Milton Keys. And then we have um, Open Science and Technology from Nottingham. Where are they? Oh, good. <laughs> and then we have, um, you know, from the University of Aberdeen, who also, ah, excellent, who also doubles as um, a member of the Brasilia Research Institute. And then we have representatives from the Institute of Environmental, the Professional Institute, Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment. We have SIWEM. Aima have their banner outside. And then we have um, people from the universities of Bangor, <laughs> and then we have Coventry, and then we have Open University, I've mentioned it, and then we have the West of England, and then we have from Liverpool, and then we have Salford. Salford is here, I definitely saw them. <laughs> and then we have um, from Manchester Metropolitan University. 
So from within the university here, we have from the School of Material Science, the School of Environment, Education and Development, of course, where we have one of our presenters, and then we have the School of Physics and Astronomy, Mechanical and Aerospace, and then we have from the School of Earth and Environmental Sciences. So there are quite a diverse mix of people. If you don't mind, say hello to the next person if you haven't done that, because you could know the next person beside you in front. <laughs> Because it's funny, isn't it? We can be looking at us and I say welcome, and yet the person behind you, you don't know. Huh? The person in front of you, say hello to everybody. <laughs> because it's good to know each other, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and it breaks, you know, the eyes in a subtle way. So today, we have quite a few things we want to do, and we don't want to waste too much of your time. Basically, these are, we have two guest presenters today. We have uh, Georgina from Coventry University. She, then we have Sarah Lindley from uh, University. She's right in front. And then <laughs> their talks will be for 15 minutes. And um, after 15 minutes, they will have five minutes question each. And then we'll have tea and coffee. So it's not only, well, we might be having some drinks too and some snacks at, um, after the two presentations. And it's also a time for you to think through what is happening, have a chat with people you've never met before. And after that, we will go into the breakout session. So when Sarah finishes her presentation and questions, I will tell us which rooms we will be going for the breakout sessions after the, after the tea and coffee break. And after that, we will all come over here to have the we'll have a recap of all that had gone through in the breakout sessions. It's not possible for, two pe for one person to be in two sessions at the same time. So the plan is we have people in the rooms who will help us to collate things. And here at the breakout sessions, we have four people who will help out in the delivery. We have in agriculture, what are the drivers for social ecological systems? That will be by um, George. And then we have one on health. Women and children who are vulnerable to environmental changes will be delivered by Ann Webb, who is right in the middle. And then we have who wants to stand on a building site in the rain? Women in industry. That will be delivered by Claire, Claire Brown. And then we have another one that has to do with um, citizen science on the brink of an earth open science revolution. This will be delivered by Catherine from the Earthwatch Institute, and she is behind. So that is the way we are going to do it. And then we'll all come back here, and then we'll have a closing session. So there will be a summary of everything, pulling things together, and then we close. But one thing I want us to know is the fact that things like this, have a reason for happening. Somebody asked that why is it we have women in environmental science? Yes, it's true. Women in environmental science is very important for us to discuss because there are key issues that border on women. Changes, adaptations to environmental challenges actually are difficult in terms of women and children. They are the worst hit. So it's important for us to know that while we are here with our different disciplines, either social science, or the core science, arts, we all have a niche, we all have a role, we all have roles to play in the delivery of environmental sciences, in the delivery of or sustaining our environment. So what are the aims? Here we hope to, by bringing together people from diverse backgrounds and discipline, to help to promote inclusiveness or inclusi inclusivity as um, the CEO of uh, IMA said last week when they had their World Environment Day celebrations on air pollution. So he said he's trying to pull together different groups of people who can see and bring together and think together the issues of environmental science. It's not only within a certain group of people, but within the grassroots as well. So it's to help us to do that, widen participation and foster interesting discussions. 
It's very great that we can come here today. We have people, the professors, who is the dean of education, the emeritus, different kind of people, you know, coming here, leaving their core day-to-day jobs to have this kind of discussions. It's not very easy. And for all of us who have, you know, come together, left our research, left our work to have ideas, I hope you find it. So in the course of doing this, we also put into consideration that this is environmental sustainability. It's important that everybody knows that thinking through is inclusive as well. Thinking through issues are inclusive. And there are a few points I want us to know because there are issues on turning promises into action. It says, for women, effective delivery of the sustainable development for 2030 means it has to cut across all sectors to be effective at local, national, regional, and global levels. And as at today, the World Bank reported that inequality within countries, especially with environmental issues, is higher than it was 26 years ago. So all what we are talking about, sustainable development, 2030 agenda, and the 17 sustainable development goals, all these to be achieved, there has to be the inclusiveness of women in the policy issues, in the implementation issues, in the grassroots issues, in the leadership issues. I will stop here on my thoughts because the main thing is that we are looking to get some of these ideas when we have some discussion. And um, before I continue, I just want to ask a quick question. And let's see who can, who can think through the answers. How many women make up the STEM workforce in the UK? Is it A, 7.8? Is it B, 15.5, 12.8, and 17? If you, know, if you are A, raise up your hand. If you are B, if you are C, if you are D. How many people are A? Okay, B. <laughs> C. Ah. <laughs> D. Okay, the answer is C. <laughs> For those who said C, yes, you know, it's 12.8%. 12, it's, 12 it's not a lot, but, you know, maybe gradually through this kind of awareness, people can start in getting some interest in STEM. And then what percentage of female undergraduates enroll in science courses according to 2013-14 Higher Education and Skills Agency statistics? A, 35%. B, 40%. C, 45%, D, 60%. For A, who are the people with A? Okay, B. Okay, C. <laughs> D. Well, the D people are very optimistic. <laughs> the, <laughs> the answer is B, 40%. So, you know, what it means is that still, women are still underrepresented across UK, despite 46% of the UK labor force are representing women. And that means, you know, there's still a significant um, underrepresentation in the STEM workforce and the lowest in Europe. So what is the wider agenda for this workshop? It links with widening participation, relates to communication with diverse groups, and fits into the concept of sustainability, community engagement. And then following our last year's, last year's workshop, we had an eight-point agenda, which is on the policy website. I will let you know during the break. I will put it across. Hi, it's great to be here today um, and to share a little bit of what I've been doing at, um, at our res uh, research centre, which is uh, the Centre for Agroecology, Water and Resilience at Coventry. Um, so I would describe myself as a social ecologist. Um, and I've been um, looking at um, how um, we very often frame uh, natural resources as a point of tension or conflict between, you know, from communities of resource users to nation states. Um, and, and I've been looking at how to frame that alternatively around common pool resources and how actually communities um, may alternatively be working together, uh, developing um, collective activities uh, to transform their landscape, and particularly how that then transforms social relations. 
uh, which at the same time transcend divisions um, through uh, what, we, what I suppose I, I, I like to call mutualities of caring. Um, so I, I, mean, I won't go through what agroecology is at the moment, but I'm happy to take questions on it later. But I've been looking particularly at communities of agroecological practice, which has a strong social justice um, strand. Um, the, the kind of conditions that, that often are, are compounding the tensions um, that exist in the communities that I've been working with over the last 25 years on the ground um, are population increases, um, the different cultural beliefs, uh, which uh, very often lead to kind of moral panics uh, as changing world views come into new, uh, different communities, uh, authoritarian nationalism, um, which is, drives political opportunism, uh, corruption and political factionalization, erosion of systems of knowledge and trust around, uh, around landscape management, resource management, um, the pressures on natural resources, so deforestation as, as, as uh, populations increase, soil erosion and landslides, uh, which also comes as a result of changing land use practices. Um, so we're looking at you know, systems where uh, monocropping um, is common um, and uh, the use of chemical inputs is eroding the soil and, uh, and leading to declining yields. So this kind of over-exploitation, we see a, a pollution of water resources and uh, rising poverty and social tensions. And I mean, we can think about that as being in far-flung lands, but it's, it's, it's very often closer to home than we like to think. So I think sometimes we think about social division as happening elsewhere, but we know in the UK that all of these, all of these things are happening here too. Um, so I was looking at uh, three communities um, across a, a, co a comparative between communities of agroecological practice in three areas of Zimbabwe all have different agroecological zones. Um, and I was also looking at comparative uh, data across uh, agroecological communities of practice and um, conventional farmers. Um, so this is a picture of uh, a, 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 um, an area called Chikukwa in 1991 before a massive cyclone hit, similar to the cyclone that hit them in March. And that's another issue. Um, so you can see that the, the landscape is severely denuded by 1991 and the um, crisis hit, the cyclone hit in 2000, uh, 1992. So at that point, after landslides had um, completely uh, suffocated houses and, um, and, and, and many people got buried, um, the community came together and started to look at how they could transform their landscape and start rebuilding and replanting and terracing. Um, and so um, the picture on the bottom right is, is, is now, um, all of these years later, uh, as a result of community action. So what the community had done in, in order to transcend the divisions which existed as well as the precariousness of, of their landscape and their livelihoods, um, they started to uh, develop tanks uh, for which captured and shared water equally amongst the community from village springs. They dug swales and these uh, became the terraces. Um, they filled erosion gullies um, which, uh, in order, with indigenous species. Um, they planted woodlots where people could share the resources equally as well. Um, they uh, started to share and recover uh, the seeds that had been lost and to plant village gardens and nurseries. And they started to teach each other through citizen science um, and, and, and collecting species from other districts as well. Um, so as you can see, this, this, this from, from a denuded landscape, this is now a food forest in one of the households and this is quite common, um, and they've now increased their agrobiodiversity and livelihoods. Um, so this is, they come together regularly and they share skills and they've, they've not only transformed their landscape, but they've transformed their knowledge and their access to resources through sharing. Um, looking at how they've negotiated change, um, they've the, the knowledge recovery through citizen science has been absolutely critical. Um, and so has this idea of blending knowledges, different knowledges that have come from different areas. So rather than seeing migration and inward migration as a threat, 
they've now seen it as an opportunity to, to share those knowledges um, and, and belief systems to create a more kind of a holistic system. Um, there's obviously a lot of farmer to farmer learning which goes on all of the time. Um, they've expanded from a farming focus to look at other issues. So they talk about you know, it being like peeling an onion. The more, the more of these issues they deal with, with a farming focus, the more they realize social injustice, uh, inequality in the community, political manipulation, uh, a lot of gender-based violence. Um, so these issues are being dealt with uh, by community groups that have come together. Um, and, and I think that um, some of it's a very interesting, looking at how their horizons have changed. They've developed new systems, that they've developed a, a system of um, a, a culturally kind of uh, discursive form of mindfulness, where they've again blended it with, with local cultural knowledge. Um, and that's very much driven by um, and attended by men and women equally. And that's changed relationships and, and reduced gender-based violence in the, in the community. Um, so I, I think what I was interested in is how, how attention to these common pool resources has transformed the way people have then began, begun to uh, interact with one another on a very human scale. Um, I think what comes out of this idea of collective endeavor um, at community level is that, that this, this idea of, of, of transcending the tensions and the political divisions that exist in the heart of every, uh, every community across Zimbabwe um, and the confidence and trust that that's built, um, particularly around women being able to, um, to participate in these, in these processes. Um, there's now a shared sense of, of, uh, of collective identity. There's far greater social trust, and this is from the, um, from the, 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 the quantitative data which I compared with, with conventional farmers. So all of these confidence, shared sense of collective identity, social trust, cooperation, exchange, reciprocity, and a huge difference in tolerance of difference of political and religious difference. Um, was found between, um, between these two sets of farming communities. And that was a trend that was found across the other communities that I also looked at in Zimbabwe as well. Um, so this kind of bonding and this constructing of positive images together um, based around a, the idea of a common future and forging a belief that one's own welfare is increased through the increased welfare of others and that came out very strongly. So some of these communities are organic farmers, some of them are permaculture farmers, others uh, work in different sort of ag agroforestry. So, so you see this idea of people coming together uh, with, uh, with this idea of mutualities of caring. And the idea that connecting people across, people connecting across social and political divides united instead around their commitment to restore and protect their shared landscape and how they farm, save and share with one another. Thank you. Great, sorry. Would you want to ask um, George any question? Please. May I ask uh, what's your opinion about the impact that charities have? In these communities, when there is a disaster like the one you have shown, you show that the community itself yeah. can rebuild new structures and empower themselves. Yeah. What's the impact of the outsiders coming in with money and, uh, and, and wish to help, but may or may not help? I mean, I think um, it, 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 the difference across the communities that I looked at is quite stark. I mean, this community is extremely remote, and it's on the Mozambican border, and 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 there there is not much, um, there's not many NGOs. So this um, this this community set up its own organisation, so its own uh, uh, its own CSO. I mean, I think the involvement of of, of, of charities can be quite destabilizing, quite demoralizing, um, but I think there's also a recognition that in time of extreme weather events, uh, like the one in March, um, that the, this community was totally cut off. Um, and I think that, that, 
I think it's an interesting question. I mean, we're about to undertake a piece of research now across a number of different research centers and go back to this community after the March cyclone because, because the, 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 the parallel between what happened in 1992 and after all of these years of uh, establishing agroecological systems, um, it's, um, we want to now look at did those agroecological systems, were they able to sustain? Uh, did they sink water um, or did they get all equally washed away? How did they cope in those extreme environment, in that extreme uh, event? So um, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to look more closely at that. And then the other communities around have had more charitable, um, uh, in, in, I would call them interventions. So what, what a lot of organizations tend to do is support farmers by supplying them with more fertilizer and more pesticide. And, and so, so we find that frustrating because obviously it creates a tension in the community. Hello. I'm just wondering about the government support to these, for these schemes, you know, when you're talking about corruption and things, do they just let them kind of get on with it, or how is that working out? Um, the political divisions at the heart of, of, of the state uh, are, do kind of, are part of the manipulation um, within each community. So the social division within each community is related to who gets access to seed and who gets access to fertilizer. So the Department of Agriculture will deliver fertilizer and seed, often too late for the planting season, but nonetheless it arrives. Um, but, but, but the communities have to put their, pe people have to put their name on a list to access those resources. And whether they, uh, whether they get knocked off the list or whether they, and whether they receive those inputs very often relates to which political party they belong to. So that creates huge divisions. So one of the things that I looked at was how um, the communities of practice have actually been able to, to be more autonomous from political structures by sharing seeds amongst each other um, and sharing open pollinated varieties rather than depending on, um, rather than depending on, on, on hybrid seed from government. And that has allowed them to be able to express themselves, not openly, because that would be dangerous for them, but they're no, they're, they're, their production is no longer uh, inhib inhibited by which political party they belong to, because they're now sharing. So even if you're a ZANU-PF supporter, it, you, you, your, your passion would be so much for your open pollinated varieties and sharing those that they'd be sharing them with a neighbor who got knocked off the list because they're an opposition supporter. So that's what I mean by transcending divisions. Um, I think for now we are going to stop and we are going to meet with um, George during the breakout sessions and during tea and coffee break. But could we give um, George a round of applause for Thank our you. Thank you. <laughs> So we now have our second speaker who is um, here with us. She will be giving her talk on urban green infrastructure and its links with human health and well-being. Sarah Lindley is a professor of geography from the School of Environment, Education and Development. She's done a lot of work on urban regeneration, worked with um, different members of uh, different schools in terms of health, worked with, that, with people in atmospheric sciences, including Anne Webb here. And, um, she does a lot of work, you know, <laughs> and I think that is a summary of what I will say. So I think let's listen to her. So please, the floor is yours. You said you want to use it. No, it's okay. Uh, are you doing yeah. it? Yeah. This one. Yes. And I hope you also know that these are key points for the Sustainable Development Goal 11, looking at regeneration of cities. While that of um, George, which she had just talked about, is about zero hunger and then no poverty. So he's looking at um, Sustainable Development Goal 1 and 2. And even there is some element of climate change, which is Sustainable Development Goal 13. So, you know, all these presentations are not, we are not far away from what is needed. So it's for us to start seeing things in the light of what we can do or what we can possibly contribute. So, Sarah, thank you. Thank you very much, Cecilia. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, 
Okay, good. Well, I've never had an introduction quite like that, but it's nice to be appreciated for the work that I do. <laughs> so, um, as you heard, I'm a geographer, uh, but I'm probably increasingly an interdisciplinary researcher. So, um, I find myself working across lots of different disciplines, and in a way that has partly um, happened beca because of really the subject area that I work in now necessitates that in order to have a kind of full and complete understanding. So I, I guess, you know, I am by trade a geographer, but as I say, you'll, you'll see that there's lots of different disciplinary um, specialisms that are influencing my work now. So I, I felt I needed to give that bit of a, a, a clarification to begin with. Okay, so I was inspired by Cecilia's um, starting point with her multiple choice test. So I've decided to do a multiple choice test of my own, which is, um, here's some three balconies in, uh, that I spotted while I was walking around London. So um, if we've got at the top A and the middle B and the bottom C, um, in terms of preferences, what would we prefer? Does anybody prefer A? Nobody. What about B? Uh-huh, a few. And what about C on the bottom? Oh, yes, many majorities. And we've all got a preference for green spaces. Maybe we're, <laughs> maybe we're a self-selecting group, I don't know. But, um, but yeah, it's in quite interesting to see this being uh, mapped out in, in, in society. And, okay, we're a slightly different group here. We're all sort of environmental enthusiasts. So, this whole idea of um, urban green infrastructure and human health and well-being... I mean, it's this stuff that we already know. So in a way, what we're trying to do is influence people um, to make better decisions for our uh, towns and cities so that we can actually get some of this thinking into uh, design and practice. So that's in a way what my research is kind of all about. That's my mission in life, if you like. So um, let's start at the beginning with green infrastructure. What do we mean by green infrastructure? Well, you'll find lots of different definitions, but for me, it's about um, networks of interconnected and multifunctional green and blue spaces in urban areas. Um, and really, we think about those in terms of what benefits they bring for human populations. I guess that's one of the sort of underlying principles, if you like, of, of, of green infrastructure. And, we could, and, and those sorts of influences, then, they come from lots of different elements of green infrastructure, whether this is green roofs, street trees, urban forests, canals, rivers, and so on. So all these different components together we think about as the green infrastructure. And they influence health and well-being in many different ways. So they can be um, quite direct and very local scale, or they can be very indirect and over uh, neighbourhoods uh, and, and whole cities. So we can think about them being environmental um, so and social as well. So environmental might be to do with reducing hazards. Um, so uh, I'll get into that in a minute. I'm getting on to my next slide. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so they can be about in, uh, reducing hazards, uh, but it can also be about influencing behaviour as well. So these kind of social determinants of health. And they operate at, at the scale of, say, of cities and neighbourhoods, but also at the, the body scale as well. So how much green spaces actually influence our human microbiome. So all these different interrelated um, influences. So a little bit of, of, of context about green infrastructure and, and kind of what we mean by that. It's a busy slide, I'm not going to go through all of it, but he, um, quite recently I did a review with some colleagues in geography and um, also in public health in Salford, looking at um, physical health and nature connections. So here's a little bit of a um, horrendogram. I think my, some of my diagrams are called horrendograms, <laughs> <laughs> which is attempting to um, summarise um, all of these interco interconnections um, and all the sort of different um, strengths of associations that are in the literature. So I just want to kind of highlight three things from this slide, really. Uh, one of them is about the environmental pathways, which obviously is of interest to many people in the room. So thinking about um, the role of green infrastructure for uh, reducing heat hazards or cooling uh, urban environments. Thinking about noise reduction. So some of the pathways associated with um, influences on noise reduction are the um, 
basically that noise uh, um, causes us to have a flight or fight kind of um, reaction. So um, by going into peaceful and quiet environments, it um, takes away that um, fight or flight necessity. And then we have a whole range of things to do with um, improved air quality. Now, that's complicated. So I'm not going to get into too much detail with the air quality. I know that there are different views on, on air quality and, and green space. But as I say, these environmental elements are really important. We also have the social influences and change in behaviour, so that whether this is um, inspiring people to go out and exercise more, therefore reducing um, physical activity, uh, sorry, increasing physical activity and reducing obesity, but also the, in, the ability to kind of influence our mood as well. So these are all related to physical um, influences on the body, the body systems that um, are in the literature, but of course we can't kind of disconnect this completely from mental health as well. So these things are very strongly interconnected. But what I want to talk about mainly is um, a research project that I've been leading for the last three years, which is about trying to understand all these kind of benefits um, from the perspective of an aging population and older adults in particular. So this is a project that's um, funded by the Natural Environment Research Council and, and also the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the Economic and Social Research Council, lots of research councils. It's got 12 investigators and three of the Greater Manchester um, universities as well. So it's entirely done within um, Greater Manchester, which is actually really exciting. So it's about understanding the benefits and values of urban green infrastructure to older people and how green infrastructure attributes and interventions can best support healthy ageing in urban areas. So it's important because here's some population pyramids that show really what the issues are um, with an ageing population. So in 50 years' time, there will be an extra 8.6 million people who will be over 65. Uh, that's the equivalent to the uh, population of London. And while I won't be around in 2066 to worry about it, many of you guys in the room will be. You'll be thinking about your retirement and we want to make sure that we have um, cities and urban areas that would support your um, healthy ageing. How is age, age in healthily uh, looking at the moment? Well, here's um, a, I didn't do this by the way, I've name checked um, who has done this particular uh, figure. But um, what, it, what is it? It's, it's showing the average life expectancy for people along the Metrolink route. And in purple is the, are the um, women's um, expected life expectancy. And in blue, there's uh, the male um, expected life ex expectancy. So a little bit of gender expectations there with pink and blue, I think. But that will help you remember. So let's have a look at what these... Um, kind of uh, their life expectancies are like along this tram route. So if you compare Rochdale over here, you can see it's 74 and 66. And then if we look at Altrincham, 81 and 75. So a huge, huge difference in life expectancy. So healthy ageing is something that's geographically very different across the city. So it makes kind of not only this work important, but also important to do in Manchester. So where do we start? So this is, this is um, me become, coming back to geography now, so making a map <laughs> with where I started <laughs> with, uh, with the team. So uh, we developed this very, very fine scale land cover, um, uh, land cover map of uh, Greater Manchester, looking at five different land, cover, uh, land covers at 10 metre resolution, as I say, so, so very, very detailed. And so even from this, we can start to see that there's this geographical difference in the abundance of uh, green cover um, across different areas of the city. And in fact, if we look at the social elements here, we'll see there's a social inequality with this abundance to green, infrastru uh, to green infrastructure, let's say green cover. Um, so here we have the, um, the neighbourhoods with uh, the that's in the sort of bottom 10% of green cover. And you can see that the average IMD, the um, social deprivation score for those neighborhoods is the highest in, in the city. 
And if we go all the way over to the areas that are the greenest, with 90% of, um, sorry, the top decile for the greenest neighbourhoods, we see that they've got the lowest social deprivation overall. And in fact, this, this is something that you see across, across England. This is not new findings at all, but what we've done is we've basically shown that this is still the case um, in, in, in Greater Manchester, 10 years after the original work and using this fine scale um, assessment. But what we also did, as well as that, we didn't just do a land cover map, we also uh, looked at what types of green uh, and blue spaces there were across the city. Um, so whether they're amenity land, brownfield, institutional land, domestic gardens, um, and we were able to look at how green um, gardens were and how, uh, how leafy different parks were across the city, so lots of interesting statistics that you can develop from, from this um, particular map here. And so you could actually see here that, that, that there's obviously not very, this red area here, I should say, domestic gardens. So not many domestic gardens up in the, the north of uh, Trafford, this is Trafford Borough, but many more in, in the south here. So much, much greener gardens as well, larger gardens and greener gardens across this one local authority in Greater Manchester. So what we wanted to do was to test um, health associations with this map and all of the green infrastructure metrics, so um, to do with connectivity, type of green infrastructure, patch sizes and so on. And we um, characterised neighbourhoods in terms of income and age profiles and then looked at the statistical associations with some of these metrics of green infrastructure. So what I'm going to do is rather than talk about all of these different, there was nine neighbourhoods in, in total, but rather than talk about all nine of them, I'm just going to focus on the older um, high income and the older low income to show you the associations that we found there. So what did we find? We found that local health status links to a range of green infrastructure metrics. So not just the quantity that I was talking about earlier on, not just the amount of green space, but also the quality of that green space and also how close people are to that green space. So here, for, here is the, for the richest older areas, here are some of the associations that we found. So the size of the text is the strength of the association, by the way. So um, let me just, just highlight a few things in here. We saw um, strong associations with the healthier neighbourhoods where there were um, larger patch sizes of green spaces, where there was more diverse green spaces, and also where there was general greenery in the urban environment as well, things like street trees. And then when we looked at the poorest older um, areas, we found only one statistical association, and that was, to do, that was the proximity to an access point to a green space. So people living within 300 metres to an access point to a green space um, had this a positive association with, with, with health, so they, they tended to be healthier if they had that option. So this is really exciting because, oops, I'm going backwards. This is really exciting because it links really nicely with um, a natural England um, ANC standard. One of the standard elements of which is that um, they want to make sure that everybody lives within 300 metres of um, at least of a green space area of at least two hectares. So you can see how that statistical association actually maps on really well to evidence why that uh, standard might be important. And it also links to one of the sustainable development goals as well, which is to, to have more accessible green space as well. So, so all this kind of story now is helping to um, evidence why we need to, to um, make sure that these standards are, are upheld. Obviously, not just in Manchester, but in Britain and across the world. Right, so I've probably spoken too much, but I hope I've got a little bit of time just to talk about the, the last, well, one of the sort of emerging parts of, of the Gaia project most recently. And that is really to try and underpin and un unpick some of these statistical associations, because if I had, if you guys were all social scientists, you'd probably be wanting to say, why is this association there? So rather than um, uh, doing this through literature review, whatever, what we did was um, 
develop a non-monetary valuation methodology which was co-produced and co-researched with older adults across the city to ask older people themselves what do they value about urban green and blue space for health and well-being. So the last part of my presentation then is going to talk a bit about what we found from that study so far, but it is ongoing. So what's this kind of um, another complicated photograph that I've got up here now? So what, what's this showing? Well, what it's showing is, is uh, something called a, a Q-sort, a Q-methodology. And this is, um, there's 40 statements in here that all are associated with the evidence of the benefits of green and blue spaces. And um, what that's been mapped onto are 10 dimensions of human well-being. And what we, what we did was we um, asked people to organise those statements into things that they agreed with and things that they disagreed with, and then working through with that into um, which, what, they dis what they agreed with most and what they disagreed with most. Okay, so that in a nutshell is what that methodology is doing. Um, and there's some factor analysis that goes on in, in order to analyse that data. I should say also there were interviews after this, but I'm not going to talk about the interviews. I'm just going to talk about statistical work. So the statistical work that went on behind the scenes was then to say, from all that, the 80 people that completed this exercise, what did they sort of generally tend to, tend to agree with and disagree with? And we're, we're linking that to particular groups of people, or you can think about this as particular values that people have got about their blue and green space in cities, here in the city, in fact. So what were the five groups? Well, the first and the most dominant group was a group that um, basically said, the world is a wonderful place. <laughs> and they, the green, urban green and blue spaces are, spa are opportunities to experience the natural world. Um, and interestingly, considering this is an older adult group, they disagreed with the idea that uneven ground in green spaces and by trees make it difficult for me to get around. Now, quite often people use this as a reason for getting rid of street trees because people can't get around them and it, older people might fall. But these older people were saying that's what they strongly disagreed with within these statements. So that's a really important group that we had. Second group was saying that we value urban green and blue spaces for social interaction. And it's part of our social life. So it makes part of, part of a place and community and giving these opportunities for participation. The third one was about um, urban green and blue spaces being a place of activity, exhilaration and surprise. So the thrill of being outdoors being active outdoors and the opportunity to do adventurous things and unfamiliar activities. And this particular group was, was obviously wanted to play in the outside uh, outdoor world and they didn't definitely did, disagreed with the statement that working in green spaces give, gives me a sense of independence. So they were an independent group that wanted to, to, um, to thrill seek, if you like, in, in, in um, blue and green spaces. They contrast really nicely with this fourth group who found, um, who basically value um, urban blue and green spaces for peaceful, restorative and evocative reasons. So giving a feeling of inner peace, um, evoking memories of people and events who have shaped who they are, and also connecting to um, the past and also um, to the people who will come after me. So that really kind of rich ideas in there um, and some of the things this is why the non-monetary valuation is so important because these are the sorts of things that are very very hard to capture within natural capital accounting methods that the sorts of uh, methods that are used in, in DEFRA now and finally um, a very small component but nevertheless um, a, a distinct one was urban green and blue spaces give me um, independence so these people did want to work in urban green and blue spaces um, and they tended to disagree with the statement that they could still make choices about their life without being active outdoors so very much part of being able to um, have the well-being element which is about being able to exercise independence 
Okay, so um, to conclude then, what I've covered is that there are many benefits from urban green um, infrastructure, but they are unevenly distributed, both socially um, and geographically. We've seen that there are strong statistical associations with green infrastructure metrics and health outcomes, and they tend to reinforce some of the emerging standards um, that we have um, and that are being promoted by Natural England. We've seen that non-monetary valuation helps to um, explain some of the reasons for these health benefits. Um, and I just wanted to end with just two little uh, plugs. First of all is to please, um, if you're interested in this area, to um, keep a lookout on the Gaia website for emerging findings, some of which will be uh, more um, directly environmental science related, associated with exposure to hazards, for example but also physical activity and motivations for engagement. And I should say at this point, we have an exhibition in uh, Manchester Museum on the very top floor. So if you would like to see, um, go to our Who Cares exhibition, then uh, that's where you can find it. And then last thing, Cecilia, I know I've spoken too long. Last thing is, um, uh, I wouldn't normally name check a, a, a book, but it's weirdly, the green infrastructure gods are smiling on me because biodiversity and health in the face of climate change is out today. <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh, I thought you were finished. Oh, no, we were finished. congratulating you for that. <laughs> oh, this is yeah. great. Have you finished? I've finished. Oh, thank you very much. Could you give her a round of applause for me? <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, I think we are just on time for the breakout session. But before that, we have our tea or drinks or snacks, whatever it is we have outside. But before we go, I think I would just let us know, because after the tea, the short break, which will be about 20, 30 minutes, we'll be going into our breakout sessions. But I want you to just, if you haven't signed up, please do so. We have one that says, who wants to stand on a building site in the rain? And um, she will be discussing the issues of climatic conditions, the challenges that women face working in industries, you know, in situations whereby women, the policies in such industries are still being designed for men. You know, there was a documentary last year and uh, a paper written in The Guardian, in, a documentary in the, you know, in the Guardian of October last year, where a lot of women talked about their, their roles and how they are so much underrepresented. In the UK, the construction industry and most industries are actually underrepresented with women. So Claire here will tell us something about that. And interestingly, Claire was here last year. She had been working in industry for more than 15 years. And following the workshop we had last year, she was motivated to make a choice, and that choice was to do what she now likes. Could you just give us a bit of information of why you made that decision before we go into the break? Because I think it just helps us to know if what we are doing makes, is making a difference. Hello, everyone. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so last year, this time last year, um, I was one day away from um, changing my life. Um, it sounds really cliched, um, but I made the decision to leave my job, um, and I'm now actually doing a PhD here at Manchester. Um, some might think it's crazy, um, some might not, um, but actually this event I found really helpful because it was full of absolutely inspirational people um, that had made changes to their lives to do something that inspired them. Um, and whilst I really did enjoy my job, um, and I do quite like standing on a construction site in the rain with my boots and my high-vis on, um, I actually wanted to um, start to make a difference, um, and particularly those that are, um, are kind of following climate change and how actually um, we have an an imploding kind of disaster facing us, um, housing actually is one of those things that I personally think um, kind of transcends a lot of different areas. So thinking about um, how health and well-being is absolutely important, that 
um, local setting, that um, how people feel secure. Um, so that's exactly what I'm doing. So uh, I'm here now um, in, well, I'm actually in Mace, so up on North Campus, um, but I do love to come come down to South Campus and invade. Um, but um, yes, so I'm really looking forward to um, facilitating um, one of the workshops um, after tea and coffee. Okay. Um, but do ask me any questions. Thank you. Well, it's good. To, please, could you give her a round? And it's also good to know that she has three boys. Two boys. Oh, two boys. <laughs> and they are quite a handful, and she still has the ability to make a decision. And she's been working. <laughs> She is a chartered environmentalist and has been working as an environmental professional for more than 15 years in public and private um, organizations and also, so you can chat with her later. And then we have, so she will be talking about that. Thank you, please. And then we have um, already, we have met with um, Judge. So Judge, she said, what are the drivers for socio-ecological systems breakdown in different contexts and what is our role? as researchers, as practitioners, in facilitating inclusive processes to reinvigorate these relationships. I think there are quite a few things to talk about there, and it's an integration of different aspects. So please, you can see, Judge. And then we have um, education. This comes under Sustainable Development Goal 4. This will be led by um, Catherine McGavin, she's from Earthwatch. She's behind. She's a learning manager with Earthwatch, and she's been doing a lot of engagement activities. So her own is citizen science on the brink of an open science revolution. How can we explore citizen science to make science more accessible and empower underrepresented groups? It's interesting to see some of the presentations by Sarah. Unconsciously, we can bring local people, we can bring different groups of people who are not work, you know, into some of our research, and that is the citizen science aspect of it. Many of us are unaware. Another thing, it could also be that we could start looking to see how we explore our communities to do things. I think we can learn more from, from Catherine. And then we have... Um, the fourth one, which is the health, this one is covering for Sustainable Development Goal 3. But you would have seen that all the other areas I mentioned are actually intertwined, you know, with the health, with the education, with the equality, you know, bringing women into issues, urban green spaces, that's the Sustainable Development Goal 11, all of them. And then, so with the women and the children, they said we are the vulnerable ones to environmental changes, including higher temperature and air pollution. How can we educate women? What can we do, especially in disadvantaged communities, to protect their health? I want to let you know that last, when June 5th, we were celebrating the World Environment Day, and the focus was on air pollution. So there were different presentations, including the Institute of Environmental Management as an assessment. Last week, they had a series of presentations and discussions on air pollution. So it will be interesting to see if you also meet with um, Anne. Anne is a professor of um, atmospheric science and she works at the university. She does a lot of work, working with different groups of people, you know, doing different interesting things. If you want to know, please, you should meet her. She's there and she's having a session. Good afternoon. I hope you had a good breakout session. We just had to conclude it because if we don't do that, our food will get cold, you know, and we don't, we don't want our food getting cold. So thank you for your contribution. That was wonderful. And um, before we come to the session, I'll just mention this before I forget. La you know, sometime was it? Sometime last year, there was the Ada Lovelace Day. And from the university policy unit, they said, following the feedback we had from the Women in Environmental Workshop, that were we looking to present some eight-point agenda or policy or what is it we have. So I put together some of the comments that we had from that, you know, from that uh, workshop. And it is here, I think it's accessible to everyone. So if you want to know what we had discussed last year, please have a look on the website. So it's, it's at the University of Manchester Policy, Manchester Policy Blocks. And if you put Cecilia, you are likely to find that 
what we had discussed, and it will give you a bit of an overview where we are and where we are looking to go. Sorry. So at this point in time, because we couldn't all be in two sessions at the time, at one time, so I want us to summarize from each group what we have, you know, what our key points were so that other people can benefit. And after that, we can pull everything together and then we can conclude. So for the first group is um, environmental changes, society, culture, and health. Awareness, communication, and control. Do we have somebody from that group to give us a summary of what was discussed? Yes, please. All right, so we were talking about how we get information out into communities. So we need a way to like, educate people on so any research that we have done can be acted on and like, get it out there and improve uh, the environment. So we can do this by running campaigns which can raise awareness because we need to reach around cultural aspects so then we can understand that people all come from different backgrounds. So people may not understand like, necessarily what you're trying to get across. So you need to find a way that you can target everyone. But you need to do this in a friendly way because then if we can get policies like, implemented, then we can get change like, through the government. But this can be done on any sort of scale, like locally or like on greater communities. Um, it's important to reach children, which can be done through school workshops or like citizen science projects. Remember, um, we mentioned British Science Week, which was a good way to get like children working in the community, because then they later on like go home and tell their parents and educate their families about it. Um, we can use like art and music to get through to people. Like it helps to engage the public, people who don't necessarily have a scientific background, like. It can be a bit daunting for some people if they don't like think that they understand science. So if you use different ways to get across to them like messages that they would understand in their own ways. Um, or you, like we can have universities working in the community. This can help if we have charities working alongside them, just like help to encourage even more people to come rather than just students, which it could be if it was just a university because that could be a bit intimidating. Um, but yeah, we just need to like, engage the public. Like, just create events can be good. Like, we need like, a space where we can discuss any problems and get people involved in that. Um, okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Wow, that was a lot in that group. That was fantastic. Thank you. And then the next one is um, citizen science on the brink of an open science revolution. If there is nobody, Adam has given me some points, so I will just read what I can see. Citizen science is about engaging the public in scientific research. And um, it first appeared 2,000 years ago, for those who, of us who do not know. And it comes under different names and is used by government, environmental agencies, and is part of the EU Horizon 2020 program, the United Nations Environment Program, and the Global Citizen Science Partnership. So information benefits of citizen science is a source of new data and knowledge. Is it accurate? Is it trustworthy? That is another question increases democracy and equality of science, empowerment of society to continue in environmental research, interdisciplinary knowledge being shared, understanding. Social cohesion is an opportunity to get people connecting with nature. I think that summarizes citizen science. And um, it enables participation empowering people and inspiring action. Thank you. Please clap for them. And then the next one is women in industry. Who wants to stand on the building site in the rain? Um, yeah, we had quite a few things, so I will try and get through them pretty quick. Um, one of the first things got raised was the fact that PPE is not really designed well for women. Uh, only recently has PPE maternity wear 
been released. Um, uh, that was just a, a point. We didn't really have much of a solution for that one. Um, but then uh, we were saying that uh, it's good to see accessibility um, when you start approaching industry and academia. So if you're doing outreach to younger people, um, present a diverse workforce because that already encourages and inspires people from those different groups to come along. And uh, recruitment fairs, if you're in an industry and you want to recruit more women, it's probably good to put uh, women as part of the face of your company as well. Um, we talked about how health issues and um, things can affect women in the workplace and how it should be, w women should be allowed to work from, not women specifically, but workforces, when you have the ability to work from different places and spaces. So we were talking about work for, work environments where you can work from home if you need to without having to explain. So long as you get the work done, they don't mind where you work from. That works really well um, for a lot of people. And also the ability for women to say no and not need to prove themselves, say, if they get offered field work, um, they can say, no, I'm not comfortable doing that. Um, we also talked about uh, anonymous inboxes and women's forums, so spaces in workplaces and in academia where groups of people can voice their concerns and not feel like it's just them and it's not just their problem. And when those points get raised enough, then uh, there's, it's always good to mention this to maybe someone or something in the workforce that's causing a problem. You know, just creating those conversations and letting people know, you know, that's not okay, that makes me feel uncomfortable is something people should feel more confident to do. And so having these networks and anonymous email inboxes can be really important for that. Um, we also were talking about seeing more balanced workforces. So not only putting women in roles such as in construction where they're not very uh, seen, but also men in HR roles, kind of completely mixing up the workforce is something that needs to be a re continued effort. Um, and then uh, another thing was um, bathrooms. That's a big thing, especially in field work and stuff like that, that women have a space where they can go when they need to <laughs> use the toilet, because that is actually something that is a problem for quite a lot of women. Here we go. Thank you. You know why I was smiling? I had an experience because I worked in industry some years ago. And while I was managing the shifts, Number one, all the people who worked on shift were all men. Where we found the women were in human resources and marketing. And then at that night, I, was, I went to the toilet with the aim of using the toilet, and the female toilet was locked. The only toilet that was open was the male toilet. And then I went around, I said, I should open the toilet. The men were looking at me as if I don't know what I'm saying. Ah! It was a very serious problem. Eventually, you know what I did? I used the male toilet. And let you, just to let you know, it's also in a place whereby males, male toilet is male toilet. You don't mix it. And, you know, so those are some of the challenges. If you work in certain industries, they really do not put into consideration the fact that you are different. Because all the designs there are meant for, you know, the people who are the dominant people. So I think talking about it is also part of it. Thank you. Please clap for them. And then we have rebuilding socio-ecological relationships through farming systems. Um, yeah, so our conversation kept coming back to the question of what is the role of researchers um, in this issue. And we found that we need to find scientific solutions and deliver science but in a way which is in the context of community needs and what is practical for those farmers. And we thought that this could be through the use of committees, um, and this also connects to citizen science as well. Um, we found that there might not be an easy, simple answer to these research questions, um, but that's why it's really important to rebuild the relationships between researchers and farming practitioners and give farmers respect and vice versa. Um, our final thought was 
this could be solved through the use of long-term ecological research, and that's highly valuable because these long-term relationships are built and they build trust between the researchers and the farmers, and this helps them to put into practice the science that we find out. So, thank you. So that is bringing us towards the end of um, our workshop. I want to thank everybody who has come, left their houses in spite of the rain, in spite of the conditions. It's June, and yet we're having this kind of weather. So it was good for you to have come. So please, let's give ourselves a round of applause. I also want to thank the facilitators, the presenters. I would like to thank um, George Macalista, who came from Coventry and who also assisted with the facilitation, and then to Sarah Lindley, who has left. <laughs> oh, please, uh, please give, them, give them a round of applause. <laughs> and then I would like to thank um, Catherine McGavin from Earthwatch, who came all the way from Oxford. Ah, please give her a round of applause. And then I would like to thank Professor Webb, who has been supportive all through. She was here last year, she supported us, and she's one of the key people who helped in organizing this event. So please, can we give her a round of applause? And we thank Claire for her work. She was here last year, and she's a testimony to things that can be positive, that in other words, we need to be positive with things and to see how we can manage our situations. We don't shy away from things, but actually face it with the way it should be opt in optimism. So we give her a, a hand of applause. And then I want to thank the assistants who were here doing the tweeting, organizing things in different directions. You were wonderful, and you are still wonderful. Please give them a round of applause. And I want to thank somebody here whom I had met at the Royal Geographical Society, and it was wonderful for me to be able to speak with him, and he is representing the men in science, and all the men, and he's here with Moira, his wife. He is an emeritus professor at the School of Earth and um, School of uh, Environment, Education, and Development. And I have cited some of his books. <laughs> so please give him a round of applause with Myra. And then we have Sue here. Sue is a friend of the Earth and is my friend as well. And she is here with Moira, who is also a member of the Manchester Community Choir. The Manchester Community Choir does a lot of work, you know, in raising awareness of issues that surround us. So I'm a member of that choir, and she is here. Could you give her, give Sue and Moira a round of applause? So we also, sorry, I'm mentioning people so that you just know the different people that are here. And then we have Open University is here, who is doing a lot of work with Open Science, with the, you know, the NERC engaging people, doing a lot of work. And that is um, Janice here, who is engaging with so many people. Please give her a round of applause. And then with um, Community Perspective and Welcome Trust and Blast Festival, bringing widening participation with science. We've done um, some work with her. And that is Anita. She is there. And to every other person, one by one, I am thanking you for coming. Shall we give ourselves a round of applause? Ah, no. I forget to conclude. I am sorry. <laughs> there is the Manchester Environmental Research Institute. They are part of the people who are also supporting us. And here is um, Emily, who is here. Please give them a round of applause. So to everyone, should we give everybody a round of applause again? And to Andy. So from what we have learned today, I think there are things we can take home. And that is communication, engagement. Also is the fact that science, social science, the arts, they are not devolved from each other. I'm an environmental scientist. I, am also, I could also be an environmental social scientist if 
the circumstance warrants it, in order we can work together to bring out something cogent. Majority of what we had listened to today, could, you could see that maybe a social science or integrated science, these are integrated environmental disciplines. And I would like us to take home that kind of thinking that what we are doing, let us see it in the, context, in the wider context, because that is what is going to bring about richness in our work. We have also learned that there are different means of communication. Engage with charities, engage with members of the public. You can't make a change in a silo. You have to make a change by reaching out to people, and we have learned about that one. The construction, they said our voices need to be heard. There are things where, you know, in the, diverse, in the different workforce, we need to be able to make a decision not in an aggressive way, but say things that need to be said. Uh, sorry, somebody um, wants to say something. Yeah, no, just something in terms of representation. Uh -huh. There's something I forgot to mention. Please. I think it's really relevant to bring up here. Uh -huh. Is there are STEM ambassadors, and that is, you, so long as you work in STEM, mm. you sign up for that, and you only have to commit to doing one day a year, but you basically go out into the community and educate people about STEM issues. And if everyone here has signed up, that's Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another thing I wanted us to know, you know, within a university, and as a university, Anne can tell us very much about that. We have different ways of reaching out to different, to the local community in order to be able to bring people into university, especially in communities where there are not many people going to school, you know, in disadvantaged communities, in, you know, low-income communities. So there are certain schools within the university that have signed up. It's called the Manchester Distance Access Scheme. To let you know that even as we speak, even if it's an opportunity that is offered, only 32% of girls or women sign up for that scheme. So there are still a lot of things that are not so quite right. So we need to be able to reach out to people. And um, finally, when we talk about sustainable development goals, there's a lot is happening. We can only do one thing at a time within the scope where we are. We had mentioned today the different things, the different presentations, the different um, sessions we had gone to, they are all related to the sustainable development goals in looking to achieve it. We can only start from a local, then take it over to national, and then global. Gradually, like this, we are able to do something. The goal one I mentioned, was re goal one was related to poverty, and then goal two, hunger, no hunger, and then goal three is about health, which you listen to, and you see that in different presentations there was reference to health. There was reference to sustaining the situation. There was reference to communication. Goal four was in education. It's about education. If you look, if you look through or listen carefully or revise, you know, rethink the different presentations and the different sessions, you see there is something about education. There is the formal education, and there is also the informal education. There are certain ways that information could be passed, and it's very important because if you educate a people, you are actually improving their knowledge base and actually improving their potential to get jobs. In other words, you are pushing into addressing decent work and economic growth. So these are all intertwined. And then we have goal 11, which is about reducing inequalities for sustained cities. And um, Sarah was able to tell us about the potential of what could happen over a few years from now. You know, when we have our aged, commute, aged, aged people, how, what is going to happen? How, what are we looking to see for the future? So in other words, there are challenges that we know that are happening now that, will not, you know, that we don't even know will happen in the future. There are certain things that will happen in the future that we don't even know now. So things are changing. And so we have to keep adapting our thinking, adapting our plans, adapting our opportunities wherever we find ourselves. On this note, I say thank you.